Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. The seat disinfected. Hey, Kiernan. <laughs> Hello, Ryan. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Um, but folks should know that we, we, we are back uh, in a bi-weekly format, a every other Tuesday format. So You've uh, always been trying to convince me to go by. And finally, <laughs> we are in that bi it took, it took a global pandemic to get you to see the, 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 the benefits of bi-weekly recording. <laughs> but we're, we're bi-weekly recording. And uh, uh, Ryan, uh, I got to say great numbers on last week's episode. It's probably a, because the... Uh, huge hit. <laughs> probably because the, the title uh, suggested that Rick Steves was on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it yeah. was actually just us uh, offering a commentary on the Rick Steves commitment speech. Well, that's one of the great things about Rick Steves is no matter how many times he says no to being on the show, we can still name uh, the podcast episodes as if he's on the show. So <laughs> we're getting that benefit anyway. So, so, I, was, I, so yeah. I, I, was, I was just wondering, based on uh, the warm reception to our commentary on the commencement speech, uh, so you you haven't you haven't heard anything from Rick Steves? I I have not no, but I think uh, the next episode we should do uh, some commentary on Barack Obama's commencement speech because <laughs> to say Barack Obama's on out of office next week that would be that would be pretty big. But just a reminder, I have so you I hope you remember Ryan that a couple episodes ago I handed over the quest for Rick yes. Steves to you. I mm-hmm. gave you the sword. We did mm-hmm. a little knighting ceremony. It doesn't feel to me like you've made much progress or even. <laughs> Try. Well, I wanted to wait till like the organic fervor of this episode kind of died <laughs> yeah. down a bit because it was so much attention. And then I'm going to take that link and I'm going to share it with Rick. And I think he's going to really enjoy it because, you know, he probably hasn't watched his own uh, commencement address multiple times. Uh, yeah, it's great organic fervor. <laughs> <laughs> Don't client me. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> uh, and, and Ryan, you know, I, I have also been thinking... I got to say, when I first made the joke when we when we started uh, recording in quarantine, this seat disinfected. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that that would continue, but it does feel almost like we're back at a quest for a tagline. I mean, I, I, I what was the tagline we even settled on? That the, this seat, the seat taken. Oh, the seat that, taken. Yeah, right, but that would classic. imply that would imply that you were sitting next to a person and we recommend at least one meter distance between you and another person at all. So, so now it's got to be, are these seats taken yeah. so that I can sit <laughs> at the furthest one from you? Yeah. These seats taken? Is this row taken? Is really what, what <laughs> folks are asking now. Um, how about uh, this seat disinfected Buster Brown? <laughs> That's a deep cut for those fans, for those fans that have listened to the whole catalog. Yeah. S- 72, go back 72 episodes, folks, and you'll, you'll get that joke. It'll be worth it. I mean, Ryan, this is episode 80. Isn't that 80. incredible? 80, 80 is, it's, 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 what is 80 in uh, anniversary years? Uh, like, what is the gift? They yeah. give each other. Is it? Is it a? Is it a? Uh... <laughs> I think. I think at that point you're you're giving each other a coffin. Yeah, I was gonna say is a is a gravestone. Is that the? Uh, Hold on, the... I'm gonna look. It up. <laughs> uh, Ryan, it, I just looked it up. The 80th anniversary is oak. So oak, at this it point, is a coffin. <laughs> so they start, <laughs> they start getting very very specific. So it's yeah. not like I feel like an earlier one is wood, and then they just start breaking down the types yeah. of wood. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I look forward to um, my oak, my oak gift from you for our 80th episode. I mean, here. I always actually deliver gifts to you. You know, we've always done the ornament exchange. You get all my ornaments. Somehow, you always <laughs> tell me the one that's coming, and I never actually see it. I'm just browsing these anniversary gifts. There is a, um, there's a, uh, let's see. Oh, there's a porcelain. There's a silver hollowware which is a metal tableware for bowls, creamers, coffee pots, and teapots. I I mean, that's the kind of thing you want when you're in your 90s. And then when you really, you have everything else. So Ryan, you want to give the folks a flavor of what we're talking about on today's episode? Yeah, we are talking about the Grand Tour, which was something that wealthy uh, young men and occasionally uh, young women as well uh, did in Europe where they would go see all the beautiful sights of, of Western Europe. And this began in sort of the the mid 1700s and 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 went into uh, into the 1900s. So into the early 1900s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you know, it, it sounds lovely. And uh, well, my favorite part about this topic is that um, a little peek behind the curtain. 
Ryan and I generate a, a long list of potential episode ideas. And uh, when we were when we were discussing what we might talk about while trapped in our homes and social distancing, I had suggested the Grand Tour as something that people might be interested in, that love, we could dive love, deep and, and, and I love, talk about I loved, history. I love the episode idea. And Ryan said, that is so boring. Like, I don't know what that is. I don't want to huh. hear about it. And no, we're going to do something else. And, uh, and then two weeks later, he texts me and he goes, great idea for an episode. I heard it from, uh, <laughs> was it Chase that mentioned, that said it to you? I think it was Chase. Chase had mentioned the Grand Tour to me I, So yeah. this, uh, Chase, this is Chase Whiteside, um, uh, acquaintance of the <laughs> podcast, uh, soon to be Peabody loser, <laughs> Chase Whiteside. <laughs> um, uh, soon to be Peabody loser, Chase Whiteside said, uh, the Grand Tour would be a good topic. And, and that made Ryan think it was a great idea, more, more than when I suggested it. I just think the amount of time that we've been in quarantine has opened my eyes to the uh, broadness of the vision of this show. You know, like there's other things that mm. we, can, we can talk about. So I think historical travel and putting uh, how we travel today into perspective by looking back at really the birth of travel for fun, right? Prior to prior to 1750, folks were not like sightseeing. You know, they were they were running from pestilence and and <laughs> burning, yeah, yeah. burning well, it's villages. It's sort of like where we are today. Yeah, <laughs> right. we're, we're kind of back there. Yeah, right. I don't know if there's anything further you want to talk up front here, but I would suggest well, let's take off, get right into it. Yeah, I think it's time. <laughs> <laughs> we're out of practice, <laughs> folks. We are out of practice. This uh, biweekly schedule is killing us. Ryan didn't even remember how to get to the recording <laughs> software. So, uh, Ryan, you want to try it again? I think it's time to take off. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. All right, Ryan. Well, as you like to say, we are flying high above the sky. We have taken off. We are, we're just laying back. We're, we're, we're actually at the point in the flight where we can recline our seats. That's how much we've taken off. Yeah. And, and we are here to talk today about the Grand Tour, which is, uh, as you said, it was basically a, a 17th into 20th century uh, custom where uh, upper class, wealthy, uh, mostly young men would, would go and uh, would take a, a journey that basically served as a symbol between their, their school years and their, mm -hmm. their, their youth into their adult years. Exactly. And this could last for months or in some cases years, depending on how deep of a study uh, these very <laughs> scholarly, serious folks wanted to wanted to die. And it was primarily British. It was uh, this is like British landed gentry. Yeah, it started. It definitely started as uh, something that was primarily Br uh, British, but th then it did sort of expand to other areas of, of Europe. When they saw the Brits were having so much fun, they were like, we got we to gotta get on this. So uh, it did expand a bit after, after that. In the very beginning, this idea was popularized by a Roman Catholic priest mm. uh, named Richard Lassers, who wrote about his travels. So he writes in, his, in this book, uh, The Voyage of Italy, about four areas that are sort of enhanced in your life if you, if you travel throughout Italy and see some of these old sites. And he identifies the intellectual, the social, the ethical and the political mm. as, as the four sort of areas that your life will be, will be, will be enhanced. So it's um, sort of an, travels. it's an enhancement pie. It is. You get, you get all this stuff. You get the intellectual, obviously. Because that's the, the acronym is pies. Is it? Yeah. If you take the last one first and then intellectual, and then what was the E? Ethical. Ethical. Yeah, and then oh, was, I like that. And then social pies. Yeah, yeah. See, it, you, this you, is there wasn't marketing back then. No, Ryan. now there's marketing. I mean, it looks. It seems like the book did pretty well. You know, if it's still talked about today. And of course, if we us. if if we if we had come up with this pies structure, I would say to you, Ryan, what do, as we always remember, what does right. pies stand for? And your first one, you'd say a uh, p is uh, <laughs> practical, uh, passionate. I uh, don't. Yeah. I, but I do like this framework, you know, I, I, I do understand. Uh, and, and I think the political back then, I guess, cause these young men were like, uh, planning for their careers in diplomacy or something. Mm, so it was worthwhile yes. for them to know the other young men who were going to run Italy and run France. Um, you know, the, my travels are less about, about that, I guess. 
Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure most of them ended up in the House of Lords at some point or another. Sure. And and uh, my understanding is that uh, the the typical route was that you would at least spend some amount of these months um, in in France, mostly in Paris. It, um, but the the kind of end all be all that that had to be included on the grand tour was Italy. Right. Italy is is Italy was looked at as um, it's it's you know we, we in preparation for this we listened to another podcast that we're, that we're linked to where these two historians sort of discuss the origins. Well, why of don't the I say what the podcast is? Please it, do. This was a, a 2002 episode of the BBC Four show in our time, hosted by Melvin Bragg. It's a highly intellectual show where they so so a lot of overlap with our with our oh, podcast. Yeah. And uh, he basically brings in professors who have who have uh, studied the the Grand Tour as their primary subject area, and we'll, we'll link to it in the show notes, as you say, Ryan. Yeah, um, but they talk about how at this point the 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 wealthy the British elite looked at Italy as sort of a back a backwater that was not you know had not uh, uh, was not as advanced as as Britain. And so, you know, to go to Italy was to, to visit, to visit, uh, I think the, the term of the term they use is, is, uh, the, ne- the never changing, uh, uh, the never changed, I forget what it is exactly. Uh, no. <laughs> Great. <laughs> and so the way that these, these British aristocrats, uh, actually looked at Italy was that it wasn't modern, that it was, it was a way to sort of go back and, and see a land where time has sort of stopped moving. And, and, um, they were so steeped in classical studies that seeing uh, Roman ruins and and uh, studying you know the the Roman culture was a major point and and there's there's some theories that because the, this political elite kind of got their got this level of education in their travels in the Roman Empire that's what inspired the British Empire uh, it, during this time period as well. Right. So before they get over to to. To mainland Europe, they have to leave England. So one of the things I think is interesting is they do it. They do Ryan, it. You you are a master traveler. <laughs> really great tip. <laughs> well, no one of the one of the fun things is is sort of how they do it, right? So they 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 cross the English Channel into Belgium, and then there you they they actually purchase a coach. Mm. They buy a coach and they to use while they're there. Essentially, sure. You and, you you don't you don't go over and, and purchase a car each time you visit Europe. No, I I'm now you know now thinking it might not be a bad idea. <laughs> um, but they purchase they purchase a coach. Some of them are traveling not just with their their one tutor, um, which we're going to unpack that in a minute, <laughs> nice. but with with a troop of servants, cooks, um, all sorts of kind of people are traveling with them in, in this little caravan of of education. So on the carriage, Ryan, would they they would keep this carriage throughout the length of the travel, and then presumably just abandon it when they well, decided to go back to England? They either they either resell it, or uh, occasionally, apparently, it was disassembled and packed. Oh, um, yeah. So that seems like a lot of work. I would rather just sell my carriage. But yeah. You, I, well, surely you could just get somebody who was going on their grand tour and just hand over the keys. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There must have been like it's like a like a basically like a zip car lot. You know, so Ryan, once you once you've got your carriage and you, you've got your cooks and your staff and you, you yeah. got kind of your roadmap, I understand that there's one person that's part of this caravan that is really key to the education mm-hmm. part of the yeah. tour. And this is uh, it, uh, you described it as uh, sometimes a, a priest. Um, well, it's 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 usually a tutor. So it's a, a it's, tutor. A, it's, it's a, a man of education and values, a tutor um, or, or a clergyman. It could be a clergyman, absolutely. Yes, but but they went by a certain uh, term that I think we, we probably really want to dig into here. Yeah, uh, it's called a bear leader. A bear leader, like a raw bear. Yeah, like a raw bear, exactly. And basically, this was a man who would escort uh, young men of wealth and privilege around Europe um, for money. You got paid to do this. And there is an example of this relationship in a great novel um, called Brideshead Revisited. Um, where where the uh, the main character is on sort of a, a partial grand tour and and is taken around by this guy who makes sure that he doesn't get too drunk and that he finds his way back to his home and all these things and 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 he was his bear leader. Um, now, Ryan, it it occurs to me, mm-hmm. uh, and loyal listeners will will so the same thing will have occurred to them 
that uh, a bear leader, uh, being the, the, the guardian and uh, leader of a young man of rank and wealth, uh, this feels like a job description just perfect for you. I would have been a great bear leader because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have, I have a travel podcast. So boom, right there. I have, I have the smarts, you know, I can identify a handful of Italian painters. (laughs) Can you now name (laughs) as many, (laughs) as many as come to mind in the next. I don't need, I don't need, I'm not going to play that game. Okay. (laughs) I'm a, you know, I'm not, but I could name enough, especially if I was in a museum where there were, where, where know, it's well labeled. Where it's well labeled. <laughs> um, and so I think it would have been a pretty fun job just taking wealthy, wealthy young men around Europe and, and making sure they didn't drink too much and getting them home and, you know, all, all that. I, I can see you're getting, a, you're getting a little flush over there just thinking about it. I can tell you really, you really dug into this bear leader uh, uh, history. So look, when I was 19, I went to Europe for the first time and I sort of had a bear leader. <laughs> we call, we have a different term. I had, yeah, I'm not going to name this person, <laughs> but I would, I, they were sort of my bear leader. Um, have you well, ever had well, a bear leader? Oh, well, what's, what's interesting is I was very um, interested in what, where this term came from exactly, because it's kind of a weird, like, why not just call him a tutor? You know, like, right. why does it have this term, the bear leader? And as it turns out, it, uh, it, it originally referred to a, a person whose livelihood was uh, leading bears, like actual chained, trained right. bears around uh, Europe in, during still, the Middle Ages. And that's still a job in some gay bars. So you, you've got your bear leader. And, and my understanding is that, Ryan, there, there's actually, while, while the intent and at least what you told your parents to, to finance this grand tour was for education and, and taking right. in the great art, um, especially like appreciating the, the, as you mentioned, the painters of the Renaissance, going to operas and theater was a very common pastime. Taking, taking language lessons uh, also mm, seems yes, very important. Yes, of course, mastering and, French and Italian. And, uh, doing things like fencing and horseback riding. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. So all sorts of- Gentlemanly things. Exactly. Gentlemanly things. Your bear leader w- yeah. would, would make sure that you were a, a good upstanding young man. And you would get uh, your portrait uh, painted by a local uh, painter. This was like a big. Mm, this was like a yes. big thing. I, I, it almost sounds like when you're on the boardwalk and somebody <laughs> pulls you over to like sketch you for ten dollars. It was like yeah. that version, and they, and it was like a caricature where they make your lips like yeah. five times as large, and, and they would paint you in like the like Roman ruins, you know. <laughs> and everybody had this exact painting. It was like you were expected to come home. Um, you know, from your grand tour with some art to show, like, look, I also appreciate this art. Um, you know, and uh, it's not not that much different than your PPP strategy of. Uh, but now, um, what's that stand for for souvenirs? Portability. Portability. No, painting not very portable. That's hard. <laughs> yeah. That's very Small. hard. Well, we, no, you, you're you're imagining how large the painting is. Could be smaller. I don't want to smear it though. That it's uh, the smeariness yeah. of a painting is it makes portability hard. Well, one thing that maybe is obvious to folks, but 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 should be said is that if you didn't go see these paintings in person, you weren't going to see them, right? There wasn't like a, there were not printed editions mm, of these paintings, yeah, right? So to, you actually had to go see them, so you could you could talk about having seen them when you went back to to Britain. It was like a big part of this was like. So you're just in, clarifying that there was no internet at the time of these grand. Tours. No internet, no no beautiful <laughs> uh, uh, art books. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah. And, and, uh, Ren, what were those other two P's? I noticed you hit portability pretty hard. Uh, pragmatism and price. Uh, not pragmatism. Nope. Uh, price is correct, but also potency. potency. And I will say a portrait of yourself among the ruins. That is potent. Highly potent. Yeah. Now, yeah. uh, price wise is pretty high. I imagine. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, so that really, I wouldn't have invested in one of no. these. Um, maybe I would have bought one secondhand, uh, showed somebody else and just put a, <laughs> I mean, they all looked enough alike. They were like just all, all 20 year old British guys. <laughs> wet my thumb and just <laughs> blur out the face on the painting and say, yeah, he wasn't yeah. very good. I would imagine that the, the, the artist would just have a bunch of just like random bodies with no heads. And then they would, some guy <laughs> would show up and they just paint a face and be like, yep, it's all here. It is. Um, now you mentioned potency and potency was also important in the, the sort of second and less talked about, uh, purpose of these trips, which is this was basically a wild sexual romp for these, yeah. uh, virile single young men. Men of great wealth and class, absolutely. Uh, and this is like the first time that they're away from, uh, the, you know, they've grown up in their family's castle. They've gone to Oxford, and and now they're now they're out for the first time, just them and their bear leader. 
<laughs> and their and their cook and their you know right, you're uh, starting other to staff. sweat you're starting to get sweat again there <laughs> their staff and they're just having a great time uh, seeing all these incredible incredible sights and and it was apparently uh, uh, widely known that many people would bring venereal diseases back to Britain um, based on the these sexual adventures that they would have yeah I'm sure Britain had plenty of venereal diseases on on their own but. <laughs> Sure. Um, that Venice clap. Everybody knows about that. That's- <laughs> no, I mean, I do you, you, the idea, I mean, when you're going months and years on yeah. these things, you know, you're going to get lonely. You can only spend yeah. so many nights with your bear leader back in the carriage. And the, <laughs> these are pre-antibiotic days too, folks. So just <laughs> try that on for size. So, you know, this, this tradition goes on for about 200 years. Um, but this is before before mass transit, as we said before. So people are uh, taking boats across the channel. They're 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 getting their own carriages. They're hiring people to help them uh, get around. They're using uh, uh, guides who speak French and all these things, right? Um, then your 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 buddy, the guy that you are you've introduced me to, Thomas Cook, basically comes out with a book um, and sort of invents this idea of Cook's tour. And this all happens around the same time that we're getting introduced to steamships. And trains, right? So, the, so there are now ways for folks of of, of way less uh, uh, capital to be able to travel more, right? And so, Ryan Thomas Cook was basically this enterprising uh, entrepreneur Englishman who was the first person to package up tours and and really make them available to folks other than the the super wealthy. And this is where you start getting, uh, you know, tourism that looks a little closer to what it is today. Exactly. So more people get to go. Uh, the, the the sort of eliteness of the Grand Tour is diminished. So it becomes less of a thing for just society folks and more. Now everybody can go to Italy. Everybody can go to Germany. Uh, it's an exciting time, I imagine, right? Because this is this is the idea of well, taking it's a few a, weeks. It's exciting for the hoi polloi like you and me. I mean, for, for the, yeah. you know, if, if you're if you're one of the these upper crust folks, this isn't so great. And And in fact, you start to see them uh, find little enclaves of their own, like the French Riviera, where they start spending more time be- uh, just among the wealthy. And this sort of romp through France, romp through Italy, eventually romp through Spain. These things are, are no longer as attractive because there are too many tourists. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and then we get into over tourism. So we've called, we've come the entire full circle here. <laughs> exactly. And then it well, all no, began no, 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 in the no, grand no. tour. The full circle is uh, then you have a global pandemic and nobody can travel except for the hyper wealthy. So that's right. the full circle. Today we've hit the full circle. <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing that these, uh, these uh, technological changes in transportation uh, uh, afforded was that uh, not only could the middle class go and take these tours, but it could expand outside this uh, Western European circuit that had been used for for decades and decades. And eventually it went on to include, you know, the Grand Tour could bring you to, to Turkey and to the east. Some extended it out to uh, out, out to South America. I mean, it, it became really uh, quite global. Yeah. And and uh, people from North America would go on the Grand Tour in like the mid 1800s, for instance, uh, in, in Gone with the Wind, the film. Uh, Ashley, who is, of course, the other man that Scarlett is occasionally in love with, uh, re- recounts his grand tour and how much he enjoyed seeing the art and how meaningful it was was to him. So this is an American who, who did the grand tour in, in, in the 18, you know, 1860s. Well, and you also have families increasingly go on the tour, so it loses Ugh. this kind of, uh, this, you know, young uh, N- nothing, hot bachelor no- yeah. uh, 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 sense once about you, it. Once you get kids on the grand tour, it really went downhill, you know? <laughs> Screaming babies on the Grand Tour. It, it no longer do you have the bear leader and and and, and his fearless uh, uh, travel sidekick. No, you've got the screaming babies and diapers and you know. Ryan, before you suggest that we are not renaming the podcast Bear Leader, uh, <laughs> a podcast for bear leaders. I, I can I can see that's where you're going. Yeah, and uh, the, the, it's just it doesn't exist anymore. I like the idea that you could start it back up this tradition, but uh, it reminds me, as you're saying, in the late 1800s. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt, when he was growing up, his family went on a grand tour and, uh, he spent, uh, summers in, in Europe where he lived in Germany. The whole family took this great cruise down the Nile where he was just shooting Egyptian birds left and right. And, uh, you know, this is where, uh, modern tourism really finds its start where you are traveling, uh, even not for months and years, but, you know, folks actually have, uh, jobs. 
but you can still manage to get someplace foreign fast. And, and really, I, I, you know, I, I mean, this, this is this Ryan in a way is the, the birthplace of uh, the great travel media that you and I are part of today, the tradition of great travel media. And there are still uh, uh, TV shows. Uh, it looks like five or six of them that are just various travel hosts recreating some version of the, the grand tour. Uh, it looks like there's been one on channel four, one of the BBC, there's one on uh, Amazon right now that just uh, highlights different stops of the grand tour. What's it so called? It's called the grand tour. Oh, <laughs> easy to find. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it, 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 this, this is a, something that, you know, has captured the imagination of people, um, especially because the idea of a two year long, you know, post-college is just the decadence of it is just such an extreme level. Uh, you know, nowadays, if you backpack for a month after, after school, that's like a, wow, what a, right. that was your, what a that great was your, adventure. Yeah. What an adventure. I will say though, I do feel, still feel that this, this idea of the grand tour is still in the European blood a bit more than it is in the American blood, because there have been many times, especially when I'm traveling in national parks that I have met European uh, kids who have just graduated from college who are saying, uh, yes, I'm, 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 I'm traveling all through the United States for the next year. <laughs> I'm kind of like, what? You're traveling for a year. I mean, I feel like unless you take a semester off or, or a full gap year, in America, it's really uh, not common to do this. Yeah, I, I, I have definitely uh, come across folks who are traveling the, the U.S. Uh, and, and for, for at least a year. Um, gosh, when I was in Medellin, I met this guy um, from Istanbul, and he was... He was on basically a grand tour of of the of the Americas. He had been he'd been in, in North America for three or four months, spoke with a lot of specificity about great cities, and now was go was now had gone into Mexico and then had gone down into into Colombia. And I followed him on Instagram, and he is still traveling. And that was what seven months ago. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And of course, I you know I feel like the equivalent, as you say today, for for Americans, it, it has been degraded into basically uh, backpacking. Uh, yeah. You know, you're smelly and you stay in hostels. Right. Uh, and and you know, I I, I it really lost all of this glamour that the Grand Tour had. I mean, heck, I, you you can't even find a bear leader today. I'm sure you can. I, you know, on Grinder, there are plenty plenty <laughs> willing to show you around. I've seen more towns that way. So, Ryan, yeah. I thought a fun uh, thought experiment would be, well, how, you know, these grand tours were all uh, in Europe, the ones we're talking about. Right. Uh, what would you say the grand tour of America looks like if you had a young British uh, gentleman hire you as a bear leader? Huh, I perked up there and uh, and said, uh, what could my year in America uh, look like a bear leader lead me? And by America, you mean the United States of America or the Americas? I mean, the United States. Oh, thank you for clarifying. Uh, yeah, it's a big difference. Uh, well, I think, you know, you kick off in New York. Sure. Right? Agreed. I think that would be great. Um, then I would say we would, we would go das, down south mm. in, into, into Virginia mm. um, and uh, see some sites there. And then, and then probably I, stop at Washington's house, maybe yeah. Madison's house. Uh, D.C. I mean, you know, sure. it's a great example to see, see some of the, you know, basically the American Rome. Mm-hmm. And then you go down, uh, and I think you'd hit some some places like Savannah and Charleston mm. uh, to give them that sort of southern a uh, southern vibe. And then you'd want to go down into Georgia, and I th- oh well, Savannah's in Georgia. Uh, you'd want to you'd want to go down to Florida. You probably hit really. My, <laughs> you're fl- throwing Florida. Well, you've got a that. year. <laughs> now, got- now, where in Florida are you bringing them? I think well, we, we've been doing small cities for a while. I think I think Miami would be a good place to set well, up shop. Let, let me suggest you've skipped a lot of nature. I'm going to suggest the Everglades get included. Uh, it, oh, just well, see, I'm, I'm going to be Miami. a terrible. I'm, my, mine's not going to be. In, mine is my tour is not meant for quarantine times. It's meant for. <laughs> so basically, know. we're going to have a, a sign with two arrows, and to the left you say, "Do you want the city bear leader?" And to the right, it's yeah. the 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 outdoors bear leader. Yeah. Got yeah. it. Okay, so you're city barely. Well, I mean, Got I think it. if you and I combined, we could do a. Oh, we a, could do quite a tour. Quite, quite a, a tour. Yeah, this yeah. is good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Even, I have gotten more into hiking. Well, you, and, I, you know and, I, and I love the city. You know, I mean, Ryan, we're, oh we're cross pollinating. Country mouse, city mouse. <laughs> That's us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 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 you leave Miami, then yeah. where to? You got to go to Texas. We're, so are uh, you skipping New Orleans? Oh no! Yeah, I guess you can't skip New Orleans. 
No, yeah. no, you got to stop in New Orleans. Yeah, you got to go to Louisiana and you got to go to New and Orleans. Are you going out into Cajun country? I would definitely go out into Cajun country while you, I'm right there. You got to go out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I remember a drive that I took from New Orleans to uh, Baton Rouge. Mm. And it is such a fun drive because you're basically on a highway through like like marsh and like right. uh, yeah, for <laughs> yeah. like two hours. Right. It's very it's a very strange uh, ride. It was a lot of fun. So, yeah, you should do that, I think. Um, Imagine but, what shenanigans could go on in the carriage. Yeah. I mean, this is a really tough thought experiment. Yeah. Here, you know, from take over for a minute. Well, here, you're right? not so, really narrowing down. You're really just hitting every major city you could possibly <laughs> go. But if you've brought us to uh, uh, to to um, uh, to Cajun country, I would say, yeah. maybe, I, then we got to head up uh, into the Midwest, I would suggest. Maybe a stop in St. Louis, see the Great Arch. That is going to be the the kind of introduction out into the Great Plains. Wow. Well, that's going to be, gotta, that's going to be a downer. You got to go to St. Louis. <laughs> All these cities and you wind up in St. Louis, you know. And then, um, I would recommend For, maybe a, sh- maybe a day or two in Cleveland. I mean, you've got a year, so you maybe you go to Cleveland. <laughs> Even with a year, a day or two in Cleveland seems excessive. There's a great, uh, there's a, a, a a great James Garfield memorial in Cleveland that yeah. if you, if you haven't seen that, you haven't seen America, my friend. And, <laughs> and so, so, so I'm taking you there. And then here's a place we could both agree. Then, then we're getting back into it. We're getting to, to Chicago. We're going to go to Chicago, spend a few days there maybe go to a baseball game. Yeah, we've go- missed, we've missed like, uh, We've missed Kentucky and, and, and Tennessee. Mm, oh, all right. So you're saying... Smoky Mountains are something to see. I, you said not rural. Well, I'm thinking Smoky Mountains and Nashville would be like a good combo. <laughs> okay. Yep. You're right. You're right. We were remiss. But we're coming back that way anyway, because yeah. we've got to oh, end back on the East Coast. So I'm I would exhausted maybe throw already. that in a second. Yeah. Um, how about Detroit? Would you put Detroit in it? I would put Detroit on I it, would actually. Too. I would, mean, too. A lot of great I mean, history there. If it was just for the museum, the art museum in yeah, Detroit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We talked about it on the show. It's fantastic. And you should probably go on an auto tour. You know, yeah. you could go on the Ford factory tour at the the. Well, you could do that in factory. California and Tesla, you know. Yeah, but uh, I mean. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm no, kidding. Yeah. Is, are, is there a tour at Tesla? Do you know? It's probably, they probably don't let you wear a mask. It's very like. All right, so then you've got the plains. Are we doing anything uh, once we're uh, like properly in the Midwest? I, I feel mean, like it's that's worth. You, you know some stuff over there, right? There must well, be a I, Teddy I Roosevelt. Would, I would say go to the field. Badlands and the Dakotas. Yeah. There's fields, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go see the fields. And the Badlands <laughs> aren't fields. Badlands are uh, giant stone formations. Very I remember. I've, we've done an episode on this. We, we, we sure have. Yeah. Actually, the podcast would be a great. The podcast is, in a way, a bear leader. I've always thought so. That's me. It's me taking my young friend Kiernan around the world. <laughs> oh, brother. Okay. So then we get, we're going to hit Texas, as you've suggested. Ob- yeah. Obviously, Austin. Yeah. I mean, I think Texas has a lot of cool things in it. It's a strange. Houston. Houston's great. A lot of good food in Houston. You know that I love Dallas. But yeah. And you love Dallas. So we're hitting all three. Maybe yeah. Big Bend for a taste of the country. But what about the Alamo? I've never been to the Alamo. I don't know. You've never been to the Alamo? I've never. I've, I've totally forgotten it. <laughs> Yeah, well, remember it. It's there. But how about you got New Mexico and Arizona? You've got the Grand mm. Canyon. You've got the Painted Desert. I mean, these are things uh, okay. to see. Okay, see, so I, Daddy, I'm glad that you're starting to embrace the nature. As you say, we, we really have informed each other's world's view. I can hear, I yeah. can feel here. And, uh, and then I would suggest uh, jetting up to Montana. Got to see the glaciers. Got to go to uh, the, um, if you go to uh, Bozeman, you can visit the great dinosaur museum that they have there. Oh, I mean, you know that great. They're, no. <laughs> he rolled his eyes, folks. He rolled his eyes. It's an interesting thing about Montana. There are 56 uh, different um, uh, counties and all but one of them have had dinosaur uh, fossils discovered in them. Isn't that interesting? Wouldn't it be sad to be from that one county? And by dinosaur fossils, you don't mean like like just old white people dying. You mean like uh, actual dinosaurs? No, I, we're out of Arizona and Florida at this point. <laughs> uh, and then and then we're finishing up on the on the West Coast, obviously. So uh, you're going to go Seattle. Seattle, a city I absolutely love. You got to do Seattle and Portland. Um, there's some great stuff in Portland. The uh, the Portland uh, Japanese Garden is mm-hmm. absolutely something to see. Uh, and then California, you'd have to, I, I, I have a, such a, a vivid memory of my drive from, um, Los Angeles to San Francisco Sure. on the coast. It's a wonderful drive. Uh, and there's a lot of things to see there that I haven't even 
I haven't and, even seen. And then you're going to get on a plane on, on your way to Europe and you're going to have a layover in Boston and you're going you're gonna to experience Boston and all the Revolutionary War history. And so mm-hmm. you're going to go out uh, right at the beginning. <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's a pretty good year. Yeah, and I'm right? glad that it, it ends in a place where you, the bear leader, can end up in Boston. We could actually record uh, one episode of this yeah. podcast sitting in the same place. All right, well, if there's anyone out there who wants to pay me to take them on a year-long uh, tour of the United States, uh, ping me and uh, <laughs> OOO podcast on Insta, and we'll, we'll make it happen. Um, oh, but the email is outofofficepod at gmail.com. It's a little, little bit different. Yeah, a little bit different. All right, Ryan. Keeps well, you I think toes. we are both looking forward to that grand tour. But uh, for now, I think it's time for the last stop. The last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. Now, Ryan, we are here in the last stop. And uh, I know over this quarantine, we've picked up a lot of new listeners. So it's worth taking a moment to explain. This is the last segment of the show, the final segment of the show. That's why it's called the last stop. And it's a moment where uh, we take a breath. It's a bit of a relaxer. It's a a bit of meditation for us. And Ryan and I each share one thing that uh, has has uh, has uh, has brought the spirit of travel alive for us in that week. It might be something we've read, something we've cooked, uh, something we 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 uh, shopped for, a piece of a piece of travel gear. It might be a TV show or a movie that we saw. It could be anything that fed the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the work-a-day, social-distanced week. So, Ryan, I have to ask you, do you have a last stop this week? So, in the spirit of the Grand Tour, I've already mentioned Bride's Head Revisited as a novel that uh, has a lot to do with the Grand Tour. Um, but I wanted to mention a film that I think is a lot of fun and I've actually just rewatched in quarantine. Mm. And that's the 1999 film, The Talented Mr. Ripley. Hmm. And The Talented Mr. Ripley is about a... Is that a um, Matt Damon? Is that... It is. It's Matt Damon. It's Jude Law. It's Gwyneth Paltrow. It's Philip Seymour Hoffman. I mean, it's a great cast. Hmm. Um, and it is about a, a, a rich boy played by Jude Law who has gone to um, Italy uh, on oh. sort of a grand, a grand tour. Oh. Um, this, is, this is like in the 50s, I think, and 1950s. And basically his father hires Matt Damon's character to go to Italy and bring him back home to run the, the company business. Um, so it is... Uh, the uh, family it, business. <laughs> the family business, exactly. So, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of a, a thriller. It's, it's, very, it's very dark, um, beautiful scenery. You see a lot of, of Italy um, it, uh, and a lot of sort of this lifestyle of just spending months uh, uh, sort of hanging out on the beach and looking and having, you know, drinking and partying and meeting women and all, all the things that sort of the grand tour was for some, for some folks. Um, but what makes this really fun is that, uh, uh, there's a, there's some twists and some turns, uh, with, mm. with, with Matt Damon's character. Uh, so I would recommend this film because it gives you a great, uh, sort of look into a couple of lives of these folks at the tail end of this grand tour, um, and sort of the American decadence and, and what happens with, uh, uh, you know, when these two lives collide, very, very exciting movie, super, super, uh, you know, it's got a lot of, a lot of thrilling, sexy. I, I, I highly recommend it. Yeah. Thrilling and sexy. Sounds like the grand tour, uh, the grand tour mentality. Kieran, uh, in the spirit of the grand tour, do you have a last stop? Well, I don't, I have kind of a, the opposite of a grand tour themed, I would say, because uh, th- uh, you know, what I'm often feeding my spirit of wanderlust with is, uh, planning my next trip. Right. And, yeah. uh, had to, had to cancel a, a trip to, to Yellowstone because of the pandemic. And, uh, Catherine and I had kind of grand visions that, uh, by the summer we would be able to, to take an overseas trip, but it's looking less and less likely that we can. <laughs> that's going to be that. a no, that's going to be a no go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, then, then we started saying, okay, well, what's like within driving distance? And keep in mind, we, we've got a baby. And uh, so we, we started uh, thinking, okay, we're, we're in Boston. You know, if you could go out to the Adirondacks or maybe we could go to the Berkshires. And uh, I, I've increasingly been drawn to Maine, which, you know, Maine, it, it's, it's uh, it, I don't know if you've ever noticed on, uh, on a Maine license plate what it's called. It's called Vacation Land. I've been thinking a lot about Maine because they have a huge national park there. And you and I have talked about it. It's the closest That's true. national the only, park. The only, the only uh, national park in the Northeast 
uh, Acadia and we would be working Acadian if we, so I'm, I'm zeroing in on an Airbnb. And this, I think, is a, a good travel tip for this uh, pandemic and quarantine time, which is uh, I know several folks who have uh, booked a, a, a house through uh, VRBO or through Airbnb. And then because of new lockdown rules, had to cancel that reservation and they lost all the money that uh, they, yes, that the, because, you know, those companies say we are just platforms between you and the owner of the property. And so you don't, you don't get a refund if, uh, even if your, your government is telling you that you have to be locked in at home or if the state is saying we don't want visitors. Airbnb <laughs> had a much more flexible policy. Uh, did one, it? Yeah. At one point they, they, they had uh, an extended flexible booking and all sorts of things. So but you people should be really, uh, really so, keenly aware so, of yes, the rules yes. so, of their booking. So basically, we're looking uh, to go uh, on the shore quite far north in Maine. And there's a, quite a lovely house that was listed on Airbnb. And I, I found myself actually having to like email with the owner through Airbnb to just say like, okay, what if this should happen? <laughs> like, right. what if I get COVID-19? <laughs> Can I get a refund? All right. And if I, and you know, if Maine says they don't want any visitors, okay. And if, if Massachusetts says that I should, I need to stay at home for 14 days. And uh, luckily the owner was uh, very thoughtful and said, listen, I understand it's an uncertain time. Uh, I'm going to refund you, uh, if you if you need it. But I'm very, very hopeful that I won't need it. And uh, some of the some of the great things in Maine, Ryan, you've really missed out on Portland, Maine. I mean, Portland's a great, I know, great breweries, I know. Um, really fun to walk around. I, I really recommend it in the fall. People people rave about the food in Portland. Um, well, right, maybe if if by the fall we're in a slightly safer place, you can come up, you can stay at at my house, and we could we could go up to Portland, Casa Kiernan, Casa Kiernan. And, uh, and, and you could go, we could, we could go up to Portland. Uh, it's, it's not, a, it's not a far drive from here. I think that sounds lovely. And, uh, and then hoping to, to maybe get out. Uh, I mean, uh, it, the dream scenario would be if Canada opens up its borders again, uh, you could actually visit FDR's, uh, summer house just over the, the border with Canada. Uh, if you go that far North in Maine. FDR had a Canadian summer house? Yes, uh, Ryan. He had, uh, it's called Roosevelt Campobello International Park, and it's uh, in New Brunswick. And, and it's really up our alley because it's renowned for its cool summer weather. That's, that's what I'm tired. Just let me drive as far north. So I'm really, really hoping on pulling off this trip. And do we have any idea when national parks are going to open? Oh, many of them uh, are starting to open now. Um, and, uh, you know, some of them are putting different limits. Many of them are keeping yeah. um, uh, the store and the, the um, welcome centers closed. But you, you can visit many national parks. So I, I fully plan on taking a day or two in Acadia, a, yeah, a so national folks, park so, that I've never been to. So, folks, we definitely encourage you before you do any of this to make sure you go to the state park website, the national park website, and just look to see what the current rules are because they, they vary state to state. And, uh, you know, I've had some hiking disappointments where trails have been closed that I wanted to hike. And it was even, even with yes, me looking yeah. it up. Yeah. And, uh, and many people are putting limits on the number of car. Many places exactly. are putting limits on the number of cars or number of people allowed in. So, uh, you know, this is, this is just, it's feeding my spirit of wanderlust, really just starting to plan the idea of going, not a staycation, but just a little bit of vacation. And, uh, I'm hoping to be able to pull it off. And Ryan, now I know that I can come back and wow you with a main episode. Oh my God. I would love a main episode. Fantastic. Well, uh, Ryan, so we'll, we'll continue with the biweekly schedule. Um, I've, got, I've got an interesting idea for our, our next episode, which is that many uh, companies out there are starting to create uh, tailored virtual experiences. This uh, includes Airbnb experiences where you can talk to local guides around the world and they will still educate you about a place even if you can't visit it right now. And uh, Rick Steves has just launched a uh, spinoff service with all his local guides where they can connect with you online uh, for a fee. So I was thinking we should talk about the rise of these services, how uh, businesses are readjusting to, to try to feed the spirit of Wanderlust. And maybe you and I can each do uh, one of these virtual experiences and, and weigh in on how, how it works. I think that sounds fun. Fantastic. Kiernan, until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, your bi-weekly 
Travel Podcast. The seat disinfected. So I read that when uh, young women would go on their grand tour, they would occasionally take a spinster aunt. So I thought I was uh, I could serve as either a bear leader or a spinster aunt, really. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely how I regard you, yes. <laughs>